Hello, welcome to Insights, Newcastle University's public lectures program. I'm Martin Farr, co-chair of the program. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to our latest virtual lecture, Women, Men and Money in Britain. Uh, in about half an hour's time, I'll be back for a live Q&A with our speaker. Uh, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat box or on YouTube, or you can add them on Twitter. Our handle is at InsightsNCL. And any comments, you can include the hashtag uh, InsightsNCL. Our speaker this evening is a professor of history at the University of East Anglia and is also the editor of the Historical Journal and president of the Royal Historical Society. She is a prolific writer and broadcaster on British history with many books and publications in both academic and non-academic fields. Uh, she's currently working on a book entitled Industrial Revolutions A World History. She is speaking to us this evening on the subject of uh, women, men and money in Britain and I'm delighted to hand over to Emma Griffin. Hello, my name is Emma Griffin. I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation to speak uh, here tonight. Um, I'll start by introducing myself and explaining a little bit about what I do. So I'm talking today about women, men and money um, in Britain in the 19th century. And this is a period of great change. It's a period of the Industrial Revolution. And I suppose there's this um, similarity in that we're living through this moment of COVID, this great change, and the Industrial Revolution was this big change that occurred in Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries. And for a long time as a historian, I've been thinking about that um, social change or the, the kind of the, the social change that came in train with the economic change that was created by industrialization. And more recently, I've been thinking about um, gender with respect to this change, so hence the title Women, Men and Money. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit and explain how I came to this project um, and also, of course, outline a little bit what I found out and learnt through it. So as I said, I'm a historian of 18th, 19th century Britain. I'm interested in social and economic history, so that kind of places the Industrial Revolution at the centre of, of the period that I'm looking at. And for some time I was thinking about what the Industrial Revolution is, uh, how we define it, what exactly happened with industrialization. But for quite a long time, I've also been thinking about what the impact of this was on the lives of ordinary people. And for the first time in history, we start to get quite a lot of records that are created and produced by ordinary people. So we have this source, or we have had this source with which we can work. They're working class autobiographies, essentially, a genre that comes into fruition in the 18th century. And by the early 19th century, we've got really quite a, a sizable handful of sources that have been created by working class men born into often extreme poverty, um, achieving and accomplishing something in their life and later at the end of their lives, writing their life story. So let's get the next slide moving. There we go. Here's an example. Um, this is William Lovett. I mean, a classic example in lots of ways. He is um, rises to the top, I mean, born in complete poverty, is a single parent, single parent, mother, a single mother. So really a very kind of impoverished childhood in Cornwall, moves to London as a young man, gets involved in the Chartist movement and comes to the very top of the Chartist movement as he becomes a kind of a figure in his own lifetime um, and writes this autobiography later in life about his life and struggles. One of many examples that exists of the experiences of working men during the Industrial Revolution. What we find as we look at the Industrial Revolution, so if we think about that period from about 18, 1750 up to about 1850, almost all of the records and all of the autobiographies, although we've got a few hundred, which is a really, uh, a really good collection of sources to work with, we've got several hundred, they're nearly all written by men. And what's very interesting as we move into the 19th century is we start to get sources that are written by women as well. So my early work was looking at uh, everyday life during the Industrial Revolution. I relied very heavily on a set of records that had been created by men rather than by women. And as I moved into the Victorian period, it became more and more possible to um, broaden out this, uh, this, this story by including the writing of women as well. And here are some examples that I've got here. So on the left hand, uh, of this um, set of screen, uh, set of slides that I've got here. There's uh, Maggie Newbury sitting in the middle there with her brothers and sisters. She's one of the older siblings. Of course, it's a life uh, with a lot of childcare from a very young age for her. 
unlike many of the men who write their autobiographies and go on and do something with their lives, and that's why they're writing the autobiography, uh, Nagish is born in the late 19th century. Um, her life, her adult life, really involves kind of marriage, um, and she doesn't kind of become a, a person of significance. Um, and that's very true of um, Edith Pratt, who we've got on the right hand side. Here she is as a young woman um, in Edwardian Cambridgeshire. She's uh, working as a servant. She's gone off on her day off, clearly, to have a, a studio photograph taken. Um, she gets married. Uh, she has no children, but she does um, have a stepchild that she raises. And that's her life. Marriage and uh, motherhood really is her life and a, a, a no great story of achievement. So as we get more and more sources that are written by women uh, for the 19th century, we also get more and more uh, records that are written by people who, who never really leave behind their working class origins, who were born working class and who also remain working class pretty much through all of their life as well. So we get a different gender perspective, um, but we also get a, a rather different social perspective that's kind of produced by these authors. So what do we find if we start to include women's voices in our analyses? What is it that we learn? Why does this change the way in which we understand history? What's the, what's the kind of the big takeaway from it? Well, let's start by thinking about what historians have traditionally thought and said about life in Victorian Britain. Oh, hang on, before I go on, a few more examples, actually. These are, these are really nice examples of other autobiographers from the 19th century. On the left here, we've got Arthur Harting. I'll come back to Arthur Harting um, in the talk tonight. He is raised in East London in a, a childhood of, of complete deprivation. Um, his mother is an alcoholic, actually so was his father. Um, they live apart. He ends up in what we would call care today as Dr. Bernardo's home. Um, so really a very um, a chaotic childhood by any measure. And his adult life um, is um, equally uh, not one of, uh, not one of um, conventional achievement. Um, so that's Arthur Harding. And over on the other side, um, Edna Huey. Um, again, a broken family, very different kind of broken family. The father passes away. Um, the mother is left with three daughters and Edna is the youngest and she gets sent away to an institution um, in I can't remember, Devon or Dorset, but somewhere down in the south coast. Um, and she considers she's been a very lucky child to leave London and to be put into the institution. Here she is. She's got a studio. I mean, we've got the photo of Arthur Harding. He was uh, photographed by Dr. Bernardo's. Um, Edna was also photographed by the um, the home for waifs and strays, as it was called. Um, and here she is um, in her best outfit that they popped her in. And there she is with a dog. So we really get very different people writing their stories um, and very different kinds of accounts that are emerging through the 19th century. So as I was about to say, what do we learn um, when we include these kinds of stories? Well, let's start by thinking about what we think we already know. What we already think we know about uh, Victorian Britain and about the Industrial Revolution and about wealth. So there have been lots of debates about whether the Industrial Revolution made people richer or poorer or happier or less happy. Um, but necessarily, most of this work has always been based on male experiences because men, as we know, were much more likely to leave records behind and societies were much more likely to create records that spoke to the uh, experiences of men rather than of women. So real wages is a very important measure that we come back to over and over again in order to try and um, understand how economies are developing and who's benefiting from economic growth. And, and for this period uh, of the kind of 19th century, uh, we really only have information about the male wage. I mean, that's partly because men do a lot more work than women. Women tend to do a lot of unpaid domestic work that is not is not paid and is not measured. So not unreasonably, historians have uh, thought hard and, and tried to measure the, the real wage, and they've been very dependent on records about the male wage. So what do we learn about the male wage? Well, this is um, an analysis from Crafts and Mills. Um, 1800 down to 1840, so that's kind of our classic industrial revolution period, quite, quite slow growth, so it's very much the argument has been developed is that uh, during the industrial revolution, uh, wages did not increase very significantly or very 
dramatically. Um, so the gains of working people were quite slow during the Industrial Revolution. But then equally from about 1840, um, a, a kind of a, a, a more happy, confident, upward growth. Um, and it's kind of after the 1840s that wealth starts to filter and trickle through into the um, hands of ordinary working class people much more um, straightforwardly. So kind of a period of not much gain for working class people um, in the early part of the 19th century, followed by a period of more sustained gains in the second half of the 19th century. And so all of this is really derived, this story is extrapolated out from information that we have about the male wage. And we can't go in and just put in the female wage data, partly because we don't have that information about female wages, but also because actually many, many women didn't work. So women's, uh, women and children's living standards were kind of dependent on the male wage. And, and actually, I think there's just a much more complex story to be told about the relationship between the money that's paid to men on the one hand and the experiences of women and children on the other. So let's uh, look a little bit more deeply at this. So I've been looking at these working class autobiographies. One of these things our autobiographers will do will tell us a lot about how life operated inside their family. And when we look at what they have to say, we do see a really rather different story from this period of growth that, that emerges from the statistics. There's Elizabeth Twist, born in Preston in 1892. What does she say about life in her family? She says, the pattern of my childhood was a comfortable one compared with other babies in the neighborhood. And that's absolutely right. Her is a very small family for a long time. It's just her. Then latterly, a, a younger brother joins the family, so two children. Um, the father is a school teacher. So that is really the kind of pinnacle of working class respectability. She says, despite this experience of relative affluence in her child, listen to what she says about the egg that her father gets. I used to observe my mother beat up an egg in a glass of milk and watch enviously as my father drank it. Nobody else was so indulged. Um, consequently, from my earliest years, I too got the impression that there was something very special about my father. So listen, this is working class affluence, respectability, comfort um, in every sense. And yet something so humble as an egg is something that Elizabeth rarely gets to eat. Her father gets an egg on a really regular basis and indeed eats it and consumes it in front of the whole family. Um, but nobody else in the family gets to eat an egg, certainly not Elizabeth. And eggs are not expensive even in this period, but it's still a luxury that's outside her reach it's within the reach of this family, but it's outside the reach of both Elizabeth and of her mother. And that, what we're looking at now here, what we're looking at here is a respectable um, and relatively affluent working class family. There are many other kinds of families in the uh, working class autobiographies, as you would, of course, expect. So Thomas Luby uh, is born in Hume near Manchester, around the same period, just 20 miles down the road from where Elizabeth um, has been, uh, is living, and it could not be a more different life. Um, so this is a life of extreme um, precarity. Um, it's a broken family. A mother and father are living separately. The father he describes as a complete drunkard. And he was interviewed, it's interesting how the autobiography came to exist, and he was interviewed by um, somebody for ITN News um, in the 1960s. And you get the impression, I've only got the transcript, and, and, and as you read the transcript, you get the impression that the interviewer was expecting a, a lovely story about life in the old days. Um, and that really was not a lovely story that Thomas Luby had to say. It's really quite a harrowing story that he says. So let's read a little bit more. He says that in his childhood, in his family, food was scarce. In the morning, he was given a round of bread by his mother, but if he returned later in the day, rather than getting fed, he simply got into trouble. No food, of course, he told the interviewer. Now, at one point, he um, ends up, he's is, is one of four children living with a single mother. At one point, he, he is no longer living with the mother. It's not entirely clear why he, well, he's not getting much, he's getting into trouble. There's obviously conflict in the home. He's living apart from the mother by around the age of eight, nine, ten. It's a little bit difficult to figure out from his um, account. And the interviewer says to him, well, 
he's living not living with his mother he's not getting fed very well at home he he starts working for this sweet seller and he ends up living with the sweet seller as well and the interviewer is like well yes yeah, but weird but young well you're living away did your mother notice that you weren't there anymore and Thomas Luby says oh no not my mother she got four of us four she couldn't keep so I had to start the best way I could now his life with the sweet seller um, starts quite nicely um, he's fed he's housed uh, he has a roof over his head he has a bed it all starts quite well, but the, the the relationship deteriorates and he ends up moving out from the um, sweet seller. So I said the sweet seller didn't treat him very well in the end, um, which is probably not a huge surprise, but that's, that's the story that he's telling. Um, and the interviewer, again, this story is supposed to be about the good old days and it's really not a good story at all. And he does ask Thomas, why did you put up with this? Why, you know, why did you, why did you uh, let the sweet seller teach, you know, treat you like this? And he says, well, I hadn't been used to much all my life much like a dog or any animal. So this is Thomas's life. Um, this is not a life that um, fits with that graph that we saw of real wages going up. Um, and it just is a way into thinking about the fact that what's happening to male wages and what's happening to women and children who are dependent on those wages can really be very divergent stories indeed and that, I guess that's the story I want to say a little bit more about tonight. So what's going on here? So the Victorian family is operates in a, in a rather different way to our, our, our understandings of families today. You need a two-parent family and the, the goal obviously is the two-parent family but men and women don't have equal earning capacities, as I've already alluded to. Women don't tend to go out to work very much because the domestic work of running a house is very, um, is very intense, very, very intense in this period. You've got to fetch water, you've got to fetch firewood, you've got no refrigeration. So all meals are being cooked from scratch on a regular basis, no electricity to make life a little bit easier. So there's a lot of labour just providing the meals and keeping a house habitable, there's a lot of labour involved and women tend to do that labour and they tend not to do it and the man goes out to work he brings home his wage um, and provides for everybody else within the household so there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a trade-off between the paid work um, of the adult male and maybe other children in the household and the unpaid work which is equally necessary but which is unpaid and which provides comfort for the man who brings in the wage now that's all works that's the traditional model that's how life was uh, lived in the 19th century and earlier, that all depends on um, the father bringing home the wage. And many do. So here we've got Billy Cotton, born in London in 1899. He describes his father as being dead straight about money. He remembered his father taking his leather purse, lifting up the flap and putting the money down on the table. He was Suki, he used to say that's his wife. The mother would take it and reach high up onto the mantelpiece and put it there. That's the model. The man goes out to work. He literally comes home on a Saturday with a purse full of money. He hands over that money to the wife who's going to use it to pay the rent, first of all, and then to provide the food for everybody. And it works. Sometimes it works. But when we look at all those autobiographies, I've got a collection of about 600 autobiographies that span the 19th century. When we look more closely at what's going on inside those families, we see that although it can work and it does work, sometimes it doesn't work all the time, it doesn't work 100% of the time, maybe not a dramatic finding, um, but something that really helps us to understand what's going on in the 19th century nonetheless. Let's have a look. If I look, put in all of my autobiographies, over 600 in all, and simply note where we've got evidence of a father behaving like uh, Billy Cotton's father and coming home with the wage and ha handing it over to the wife. How many times do we see this, this story being told? It's told often, but not all the time. So there we go, um, just over 200, we've got very clear evidence, or it seems we've got clear evidence that the father is sharing his wage and his gains are being shared by everybody within the family. But then that clearly leaves us with quite a lot where that is not happening. That's going in the wrong direction, there we go. There we go, all those where we don't see that happening. So 
what I want to do next is unpack a little bit um, all of those cases where it doesn't seem to be happening and think a little bit about what's going on, about what the causes and what the consequences are of that in these families. Let's go in my direction, there we go. Here we go. So what other kind of stories do we get told in the autobiographies? Let's start off with those good providers. So we don't always have stories quite like Billy Cotter's where he literally says, my father had it over the money because autobiographies are really, people tell their stories in very, very different ways and they, they emphasize different things. But I've put these 200 together in one group because there seems to be evidence that that is what is happening. Either because we've got a really good description of the father being described as a good provider who was self-sacrificing and hardworking, or sometimes there's just other evidence such as the family manages to buy a piano or to put lino down in the kitchen or some other kind of investment in family infrastructure that suggests um, that the wage is being shared around um, and kind of pooled for the common good. Clearly that's not, there's evidence that's, that, that, that's not happening in all of the families and we can unpick a little bit the other stories where those other, other instances, we can unpack those a little bit and try and make sense of what's going on. Well, the most obvious um, kind of shortcoming in that model is mortality. There's a period with a relatively high death rate, much higher than our own. Um, and unsurprisingly, some children will lose their father during their childhood. Um, and so that takes quite a lot of fathers out of the autobiographies. And because there's no other kind of redistributive mechanism in Victorian Britain, um, I mean, one wouldn't want to blame the fathers for, for being for being dead. I mean, it's not like a criticism, but if we look at the way the society is structured, we can see there's a real um, shortcoming in that there is no real mechanism to support families who don't have an adult male breadwinner, even when that's just the accident, the lottery of life or the lottery of death that, that's deprived the family of a wage earner. So that is definitely um, one of the, the, the key um, forces that's undermining well-being within families but very far from being the only one. The fathers don't pass away. We also have a collection of fathers who, though they are living, are unable, through no fault of their own, to earn a wage, either because they are chronically ill or because they face um, unemployment, and again, through some kind of fault that is just completely outside their hands. Now, I always think um, that actually that proportion who can't work through their fault of their own, it's actually not that high. And I think there are a couple of, a couple of reasons for this. I mean, partly when fathers are very ill, for example, um, that tends not to be something that endures all through a childhood. Um, if the father's very ill, he's probably either going to pass away or he's going to get better. So very often illness is, is just a window and not something that necessarily um, impacts the whole of a child's life. And likewise, unemployment can be acute, uh, but tends to resolve. Um, so although there is more evidence in the autobiographies of fathers who are ill and fathers who are unemployed, the uh, example of childhoods that have been blighted by this, uh, where this is kind of a very long-term and chronic condition rather than something that's acute and short-term, um, is not that, is actually not that um, enormous. And I think that's for the reasons that have been um, explained. Also, it is a boom economy. So unemployment for a lot of the Victorian period, it is a period of growth. So it's not the most acute problem at this time. Alongside those who can't work for reasons that are outside their control, we also have a relatively small number, about an equal number, who are fit and healthy and who can work, but who don't work very regularly. So for the first time, or unusually in terms of British history, it's now possible for men to earn relatively high day wages in mining or in industry, in quarry, there's relatively high paid work available. This gives the, the men an opportunity to work a few days of the week, but not necessarily, not necessarily for all the days of the week, or to work um, intensively for a fortnight and then to take a fortnight off. So there's this possibility of different working patterns. And we definitely see that in the autobiography. Some um, men are taking advantage of the male of, of higher wages that industrialization in the cities are offering in order to work less rather than to raise the living standard of the family. But again, this is not the most, um, it's not the most dominant trend. When we actually count it up, 
is not the most dominant trend. And I think that partly because male, maleness, manhood is very closely tied up with work and with wage earning. Um, so although men do have this option, some men take it, it's not the most um, appealing route for men to take. Um, it, it, it happens, um, but it's only making up a very small, a relatively small part of our explanation for why some families are not gaining from gains in the real wage. Much more significant than the fathers who choose not to work regularly are the fathers who work, um, who do work regularly, but who don't share their wage. And this actually proves to be a much more significant problem. So these are fathers who go out to work, who bring back the wage, and then somehow it doesn't get passed on to the mother, doesn't get passed on to the family. There's a trip made to the pub very often on the way back on a Saturday, and the, uh, pay, uh, the, the pay packet has been rather depleted before it, it, it reaches the family. And this is a story that's told many, many times over. So again, we've now got men for the first time in history really able to earn much more than is needed for raw subsistence, because it is a growing economy. But that extra money, some of the families, this, this blue bar at the bottom, some of the men are bringing it back and they're enriching their families with that extra wage. But clearly some of the men are enriching themselves. They're developing hobbies, they're getting involved in politics, um, they're getting involved in sports. They're drinking very heavily. That's definitely one of the ways that the money is going. But whatever reason it is, the money is not coming back to the family. And so there's this real mismatch that can be emerging in some of the families between a man's potential to earn money and the real lived experience of the uh, other members of that household. So the non-sharing of, uh, of wages is definitely a significant part of our story. In addition, we've got um, fathers that are leaving their families altogether. Okay, I think there have always been some fathers that have deserted, but historically it's been very difficult to run away because communities have not wanted to raise um, other men's children for them. So there's been a lot of social pressure for men to stay with their families and to support their families. Um, and lots of, kind of social mechanisms in small face-to-face -face societies that make sure men raise their children themselves. When we move into the Victorian city, uh, the Victorian period of the big cities, the higher wages, much easier for men to slip away from their family responsibilities altogether, for families to break down. And that is something else that we're seeing here. And this is really significant from a family living standards point of view, because when men have left their families, that is it for any kind of support that they will get. We've already mentioned how this society has no mechanism for supporting families when the male breadwinner is dead. Well, obviously there are no mechanisms when the, the father is just absent rather than dead either. And in some ways this puts families into even more of a bind because a widow can remarry. Um, a deserted wife doesn't have the option to remarry. So this, um, this trend towards desertion is something that's very immiserating at a family level, very significant. That's desertion. In addition, then we've got those we don't know. I mean, not everybody tells us what's going on inside their families in great detail. We can't, I, I can't tell you more than what's going on in these 500 families, another 100 where it's not really clear um, quite what's happening. Um, but I think we can, we can say enough about the families that we do have. And most of the families tell us something about how wages are being shared. And we've certainly got enough there to suggest that at least half of all our Victorian families, all our Victorian autobiographers, have got some kind of story to tell that suggests that the male wage is not, um, it, it, it is not really the primary determinant of living standards in their family. Okay, I've just got a few minutes left, a couple of other points I want to make. Firstly, I've suggested that these are simple stories and that everybody fits neatly into one of these categories. Actually, uh, family life is really messy and it doesn't revolve, resolve in that very simple way. So back to Arthur Harding, who I introduced at the beginning. He says of his father, he had bad eyesight. Through failing sight, he couldn't keep us. So he's got the illness, couldn't work because of illness. He also describes his father as being unemployed because of his failing sight. So we could see that Arthur Harding's father could perhaps um, fit into that category of fathers who were too ill uh, or suffered from some kind of uh, misfortune that was beyond their own control. 
but actually Arthur says a lot more about his father. He's got two different versions of the autobiography. The second version is where it all comes out. He also says his father was a loafer, too lazy to earn a living, doesn't care for the family. Um, so he's very much in the non-sharing of wages uh, category. He was a selfish man who only lived for himself. Just an encumbrance, really, says Arthur. There he is. That's um, Arthur Harding's father at the beginning of his life, a nappy young man. At the end, uh, he was an alcoholic as well, he mentions. Um, so he's, he's just a, a very declined and degenerate man. And if we actually we just go back to our patterns of provision, Arthur Harding's father would belong in almost all of these. Um, he was never a good provider, but otherwise he was really, he kind of spit between all of these categories. I put him into the desertion category in the end because that's always the most um, it, it trumps everything else, if you will. That's a, that's a really strong, strong story that's being told there when you've got people in that category. So just to wrap up is where we began. So we think uh, if we look at male wages, if we, we calculate the best we can with the male wages, we put it all into an Excel spreadsheet, we drop a graph. What do we have? We have a period of rising real wages. And most historians have just assumed that if you've got rising wages, rising male wages, you're looking at a period of rising living standards. And I suppose what I've tried to do here is to suggest that if we look a little bit more closely at what's going on inside families, and think a bit more deeply about how money is being shared inside families um, and between the individuals, that story becomes a lot less straightforward. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a benefit to putting in um, women's experiences and, and making them sit alongside um, men's experiences because it's quite possible for men and women's experiences to diverge and it's that that, that point of divergence um, that is really the, the the point of significance and what's most interesting and really um, enables us to rethink some kind of standard assumptions we have about the way economies work about the way the wealth is shared um, and a way the, the way that living standards develop as well. I'll stop there and I'll be really happy to take uh, questions from people. And we're back live with our speaker, Emma Griffin. Thanks so much and welcome to Insights. Hi. Uh, we're joined online. We're delighted to be joined online by Yarm School. Um, and I think it's their sixth form who are watching uh, and they've asked some questions and I'm delighted to be able to put them to you. Uh, Yarm School asks, first of all, how far do you think that current social problems in England can see their origins in the Victorian male breadwinner family structure that you talk, you talk about in your book, Breadwinner? For example, unemployment, use of food banks, etc. Oh, lovely question. Um, I do think that um, our society that we live in today and our very unequal society and particularly one of the things I think you said about our society, food banks, we're a rich society, we're a really rich society, there's lots of food 
available in Britain. And yet we also have food banks. And that's this problem of poverty and plenty sitting side by side, where you've got the means, you've got, we, we're a country that can afford to feed everybody and feed everybody very well, but we don't share the resources very equally. And that means that some people end up having nothing to eat and using a food bank. And that's really different from life before the Industrial Revolution, where societies tended to be really poor and there wasn't enough food. And it wasn't just a distribution problem. There were just poor, small economies that didn't ever really have food security. Um, so in terms of this question about the origins, I would say um, by the period that I'm looking at in the late Victorian period, we're starting to see much more of the modern world that we know and much less of the old pre-industrial world that we don't know at all. So what's really striking and what I was really interested to find out about this period is that it's a society in which there's actually quite a lot of plenty. I mean, not as much plenty as we've got today. But there's actually quite a lot of food around, but you've got that really familiar problem where you can't connect the poor with the food. And it's really evident in, in the lives of children. So if you're in a household that for some reason is what we would call chaotic today, um, you don't end up having a healthy diet. The society could afford to feed you. The money is there and the food is there but we can't get it into families and we can't get it into households. So I think there's a real kind of continuity between this late Victorian period. And in some ways that it's interesting to think there's, there's been a real break with um, life in Britain before the Industrial Revolution, when there just wasn't those kinds of resources available. And the proliferation since the financial crash of, of charitable provision, uh, very Victorian, in a curious way, the big, I mean, the big society, the David Cameron Initiative in 2010 was, was, was harking back to some of those um, social networks, wasn't it? It is, and I mean, I think, I think, uh, harking back to the idea that we can, that there, are, maybe that there is, there are simple fixes, and that families or societies can 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 come up with a fix. Um, and I think what I would argue is governments, you know, big complex modern societies such as our own, such as the Vic late Victorian period, governments need to be the place that provide the fix. And I think that big society was the idea that somehow government wouldn't need to do anything. And I don't think we've got any evidence over the past one hundred and fifty years that. Um, societies or families can fix these problems. You do need kind of much stronger levers, and the, the only the government really has that has its hand on those kinds of powerful levers. And it immediately enacted them, didn't it, when the pandemic struck? I mean, that the state took over all aspects of society um, in a way we haven't seen since the the war, really. Exactly, really good example. And, and rationing, so you rationing in the First World War and in the Second World War, and in both cases, there's really good evidence that some people's nutrition improves. Um, mm precisely because they had been left out before. And as soon as government puts its hand on the levers, then actually you can solve these problems quite straightforwardly and quite easily. Have you looked at all, I know this isn't necessarily an area of your research, but have you looked at all into the, the, the social consequences of the pandemic on children, for example, on an ed education, both at school and university? Oh, I, I am a historian. Um, so I don't know very much about what's happening um, with the pandemic and the effect on lives of people today. So I'm probably not the best person to ask that question. Is there an equivalent, I mean, in my in the era that I teach, the Second World War, First World War, there were parallels with what's happened in the pandemic. Is there anything comparable in the Victorian or the 19th century, uh, of, which was societal on such a scale as, as this? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the, the I mean, there's, there's no pandemic, as, well, I mean, we've got the, the, the flu pandemic, but there's no kind of government response um, and it, 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 it you know impacts society in, in a very different way. I mean, I suppose the, the, com, the, 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 the comparison is, the First World War. Um, and I mean, one of the other things that happens with the First World War is men go off to fight. And that means that their their war pay isn't paid into their hands when they're at home and they work. Well, I mean, OK, we're speaking to people in Newcastle today. They were down at the docks or um, they're, they're, you know, they're working. They get paid on a Saturday and they make a detour via the pub on the way home. And a lot of the wages mm -hmm. that they're earning never actually see the hands of you know, their family, never see the wages. What happens when those men go off to fight in the First World War is that the pay goes directly to the wife. They literally pay the money to the wife. So you'll see over and over again, um, even if fathers go off and even if fathers are earning less, all of the money comes into the household. So that household will report actually being much better off um, without the father there. So I guess there's a, um, I guess there's a similarity there um, with the pandemic in that We've just got kind of different ways of distributing money um, and the state is getting involved. And, and, it, and I think a lot of what I'm looking at is that getting the money, we think of it 
we often think about these things in terms of what the wage is and what real wages are. We spend a lot of time trying to measure what real wages are. Um, I suppose my question is slightly different and it's not what the wage is, but what reaches a family and what actually comes into the family. And I think the, the, the parallel with the pandemic is, again, we're splitting away a little bit apart from what the wage is and thinking a little bit more about other ways of paying people outside the, the fact of going to work. Yes. Uh, we have some questions arriving from our viewers. Just to remind you, you can add, you can ask questions and raise comments in the chat box on the YouTube channel and also on Twitter at Insights NCL is our handle. Uh, Jeremy asked questions. Surely there is a huge difference in family life caused by the late 19th century fertility transition. Well, there is, but the late 19th century fertility transition is still quite um, I mean, it's a slow transition that's happening all over the 19th century. So by the end of the 19th century, I mean, it's also it's it's quite class dependent. So a lot of that is being driven by middle class families um, and higher income families. Um, you do have a reduction in family size amongst um, lower income families as well before the First World War. But it's a story that carries on well through the 20th century. It's not it's not purely a story um, for me. Yes. Um, all things being equal, a smaller <clears throat> family will have more money um, per member going round. So all things equal, having a smaller family, that will help. But if you've still got a father who's not bringing back very much of his wage, not sharing it, that in itself is not going to solve the problem. Or a father who's a heavy drinker and is drinking a lot of his wages at the pub, there's going to be a worse problem if you've got seven children than if you've got two, but it's still going to be a really serious problem even if you've only got two children. So I think there are lots of different forces um, playing together here, lots and lots of different forces. And, and one other thing was that, that decision to reduce the family size, we don't have contraception at this time that wives can just use on their own. So they don't really have control over their family size unless they've got a husband who is collaborating with them and feels the same way um, and wants a small family and wants a better standard of living. So if you've got a if you're married to a man that doesn't want those things or doesn't care about those things, um, then that's going to you know you, you're going to be part of that part of the population that can't reduce your family size and can't get those gains those gains. So a lot of this is kind of bound up together as well anyway. Mm. Um, and Piers has asked a question I think related to your answer to um, Jeremy. Uh, Piers asks, what about rural economies where women and men both contribute to feeding the family? Rural economies. Mm. Yes. So interesting, exactly, exactly. When you go out, I mean, so you've got these big cities that have emerged by the late 19th century, places like Newcastle, Liverpool, Birmingham, there's loads of these big urban areas. And it's in these areas where you seem to have real problems with men being unreliable wage earners. You go out, not even a very long distance, because all of these cities, you only go a few miles and you're outside in villages um, and you're in agricultural areas. You go relatively short distances out into the countryside. And you see really, really different patterns of behaviour where the labour and the work that men and women do is different. It's still very divided. So men will do the heavy work and men will do the paid work. Women will do looking after the garden, um, doing the cooking, fetching the water. There's, there's other things that women do, plus a little bit of agricultural work. But all of that work that the woman does is really valuable. It's got a real value to the household. So you tend to find um, much more collaborative and cooperative families in rural areas where there's a kind of equality between what the man does and what the woman does. And it's in these urban areas where men can go out and earn relatively good wages that you get this kind of breakdown of the equality and you get all the problems um, that I'm looking at as well with kind of bad breadwinning, unreliable breadwinning, drinking, these kinds of problems are very much urban and not rural. We have a great question from Yarm School. Uh, with these narratives you're using for evidence, to what extent is there shifting expectation change across generations within the Victorian period? That's a lovely question. Um, and I can't, I mean, I think <clears throat> there's a lot of change over the 19th century. Um, but I, I think it's quite hard to pinpoint when that change is happening in terms of time and, and what's happening over the generations. And I think that's partly because, although I've got lots of sources, and I think I'm really lucky as a historian that I managed to find several hundred, I've still only managed to find several hundred, and we're looking at a society of several million. Um, so it's very difficult for me to kind of pull out those really granular stories. 
Um, and as I say, the big thing that I have been able to pull out is this difference between urban and rural areas. Um, and that, that seems to be like a really striking difference that we see everywhere. But we also see it at the beginning of the 19th century. There are big towns in the beginning of the 19th century. And you have all the problems with breadwinning then, um, as I've been talking about for the late 19th century. And you have villages at the end of the century and you have all the good breadwinning there. So for me, it's much more of a kind of a, a geographical story than it is a chronological story. Though the, the chronology is clearly in there. Um, yeah. Uh, a question about life writing uh, from James. He asks, how accurate are autobiographies as sources? Are there limitations you need to be mindful of? Yes. Well, very good question. Of course, no source is perfect and my sources are no exception. The autobiographies that I look at were not written by people who wanted historians later to be able to understand how Victorian Britain worked. They were written with a completely different motivation. Like all sources, they're not created for academics and historians and other uses that later generations might have. So we've got to do a lot of reading against the grain and we've got to think quite carefully about what these sources do uh, and what their possible biases are. With that in mind, um, I guess the question you always have to ask is, are these sources going to tell a falsehood? Are they going to be unreliable in a systematic way? Are they going to be biased to one particular kind of narrative? So uh, the example is the rise of the misery memoir and things like um, Frank A. Court's um, Angela's Ashes and things like that, the Court's Angela's Ashes. You know, they obviously give us a really negative misery childhood. And there's a real burst of them onto the scene in the 1990s. It would be a mistake probably for later historians to read all of those and think, oh my God, there was a real rise in dysfunctional families. What we've got is the emergence of a genre that talks about dysfunctional families. Um, I don't think that's the case, though, for the late Victorian people, because when you see people writing these really negative stories, they're always really unapologetic and they're often trying to hide what it is that they're saying. So they will describe a father who's violent and drunk. And then they'll say things like he was a good dad. He was a really good dad, my man, um, my father. Um, and I shouldn't criticize him. It was a shame about the drinking. So they're not actually trying to dish all the dirt. It's just that it's really hard to talk about your childhood if it was blighted by a, a violent or abusive person, then it, it, it creeps into the narrative. There's not the point of the narrative. It's kind of almost a footnote. Um, but, you know, I mean, uh, uh, what could you, you know, just more generally, yep, sources are never perfect. You just got to think, you know, it, 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 it can't stop historians doing what they do. All the sources have problems. We still got to try and get stuck in and see what we can do with them. In the 20th century, when autobiographies, when the when the business of publishing becomes much more more much more uh, widespread, they they very largely um, sort of pri uh, privilege uh, people of power. So obviously, men, politicians, uh, people wanting to tell their own story. So that can be if if they're only, if only they are used, it can be a rather misleading view of, of how things actually are. It could be very misleading, um, and of course, it's a problem, it's a real problem for my period as well, and particularly the earlier period. A lot of the sources that have been produced have precisely been produced by somebody who went on and became a Labour MP or who went on and became a poet or who went on and became somebody big in the Chartist movement or the union movement, because that's why these, you know, they write their autobiography because of the thing that they did. What's lovely about working with the Victorian period is you also get lots written by people who don't become significant and important in any way. So that's a really nice change. Um, earlier in the period, you don't really get those. The 18th century, very unlikely to get them by people who remain nobodies. So you do get those. Um, the other thing that I would say is in this particular bit of research that I'm talking about tonight, people are talking about their childhoods. So it's not about what their life is like as an adult. It's about those early years, the first six, seven, eight, nine, ten years of their lives. Um, and that's even if you go on and become a really big Labour politician, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to change the way you talk about those early years of your life if that makes sense so i think it would be wrong to write a story about social mobility according to my sources it would look like a really socially mobile um mm. population mm. because most of the writers go on and become socially mobile so i think you wouldn't want to tell that story with them um, but i think there are still stories that you can tell with them you've just again just got to be careful and show judgment all the way along mm. the critical critical faculties are always the, the most important thing for the historian sarah asks uh, what motivated people to write their own autobiographies 
Oh, many, many different reasons. So obviously some of those people are writing their autobiographies, as I've just been talking about, because they've done something. That's, that's their motivation. But by the time we're looking at people who were born at the late Victorian or Edwardian period, a lot of these autobiographies are being written by people in the 1970s, even in the 1980s. Um, and by that point, you've got kind of the rise of oral history and social history and local history. And you very often got people that are just being prompted to write their memories by a grandchild, for example, who wants to know more or maybe talk about it at school or just thinks it's really interesting. Um, or you've got kind of local history projects that are just going around old people's homes saying, tell us something about your memories. We'll just get the tape recorder out. Um, so you've got loads of different motivations. And I think that's why they become so interesting as you go on. The early ones, early autobiographers born in the earlier Victorian period, they tended to write because they were motivated, because they've become somebody special. And it means you do get a particular kind of narrative. Later on, all sorts of people write, ordinary people write, really ordinary people write, who were born poor, who work all their life in a working class occupation and are now still quite poor. Um, and, and it's just wonderful when you get these kinds of voices emerging as well. Um, yeah, they're just fantastic sources to work with. And you, the past looks very different when you work with them as well. And these are very different motivations from those that public figures have. So to, to tie Sarah's question with James's, I mean, we discussed the First World War earlier. David Lloyd George's war memoirs are thoroughly unreliable, uh, mendacious even, and were motivated to settle scores and to have himself as the person who, who won the war. So if one used those as the source alone, one would have a very, very partial view of the First World War. And in, in fact, knowing that they're unreliable actually makes them a useful source, um, but only if you have the wider critical faculties, as you, as you were saying. Um, a very nice question from Jan, which broadens our discussion in a way that I was quite keen to do before we wrap up. Um, Jan students ask, given the closure of history departments in some UK universities, do you believe academic history is under threat in higher education? Why do you think this is? And what do you think should be done about it? Oh, I love that question, because funnily enough, I've been writing to a Guardian journalist just today, trying to get them to write a story haven't had a reply, sadly, um, but it's early days trying to write a story about precisely this because history is under threat. Now, I don't think it's um, I, could, I don't think it's that universities don't want to teach history. I think there's lots of desire to teach history in universities. I think it's government policy. And I guess it goes back a little bit to what I was saying at the very beginning, that the government holds a lot of the power in our society. I think it's to do with government policy. I think it's because the um, government has removed the the cap on the number of students that each university can admit because they basically want to make universities like businesses and they want to make all the universities compete amongst each other they want to make us kind of competitive against each other and i don't think that's a good model for higher education i think the model for universities is that we should collaborate so people like me and martin we're at completely different universities we don't we don't and we shouldn't consider ourselves in competition with each other we're going to work much better and produce much more interesting research if we collaborate with each other and we work together and we share our ideas. Um, but the model that's been introduced is one of competition. And I think that's why I think that that's that, that's connected with why we're seeing closures of history departments. I think it's really worrying because we're seeing departments close often in newer universities, mm -hmm. um, smaller universities, often universities that do amazing work in teaching history to people who perhaps are the first in their generation to go to university, who don't have that kind of experience of university, very often come from lower income backgrounds. Um, and it could be a life changing experience to, you know, offer high quality um, history education. So I'm very concerned about it. I'm truly very concerned about it. I think it's connected with um, government policy and the desire to make us be competitive um, and uh, I think it's really undermining many, many academic values, and that's something that I'm very concerned about. Given, I mean, you, you became president of the Royal Historical Society, which is the, the spokesperson for the profession uh, in the middle of this historic event, the pandemic, um, was quite a challenge. I and mean, how, how has the pandemic affected the society and the discipline, would you say, it's ongoing as I realise it is? Yeah, it's a really lovely question. I mean, it it's, I mean, it's like all organisations. It's been a bit of a whirlwind and there have been things that have been negative, um, but there have been things that are really positive that we've discovered. So what we've discovered, we put on a lot of events, we tend to hold them in London and we're a national organisation. 
obviously people um, in many, many parts of the UK really cannot afford or have not got the time to get down to London for a one hour lecture or a two hour event, it's just impossible. Um, so we've been putting them all online and our attendance and engagement has really, really improved. So for us, that's a real um, takeaway. That's something that's really important to us that we can connect with everybody um, and that we can be kind of meaningful to people in Newcastle as well as being meaningful to people in London. Um, so there's that, that's really good. Um, however, it's also meant that none of us get into the room and have proper conversations with each other. We don't go for dinner um, and we don't chat over bad sandwiches at lunchtime. Um, and these things are negatives as well, because mm -hmm. in order to work collaboratively, we, we need to just not actually sit in our homes and look at computers and chat down the, you know, down the Internet. We do need to have a little bit of proper chit chat as well. So but we're finding our way, um, you know, uh, it, you know, it's, it's been a real journey. Um, and very interesting. And I'm, I'm really hoping that we will come out the other end. I mean, the other thing, the office has gone virtual and we've not, there's not been a problem. It was a physical office. Everybody had to be there. Mm. Now it's virtual. So it's been amazing and we're still learning. Um, and I, I hope we'll be able to come out stronger, more resilient and more relevant to more people. On that very positive, indeed stirring note, uh, with which I fully agree, um, we come to the end of our time. Um, thank you very much, Emma Griffin. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for the invite. Thanks everybody and for listening. Thank you very much. And to our audience for watching, uh, our next event will be on Tuesday the 19th of October, when we have Darren Henley, Chief Executive of the Arts Council England, in conversation. We hope you join us then.